Welcome, Sister Linda Bevilacqua. Thank I you. I finally uh, am delighted that we got you here. And not only are we lucky, we have you in person Thank here you. on campus because of our transfer of leadership happening uh, in a couple days. So yes. you're a blessing to be present here. Well, thank so you. what we like to do, we know a lot about what our women have been about in, in their ministry, but we want to get down to know a little bit more about the person. So if it's all right with you, we invite you to share with us some of your beginnings, where you grew up and uh, your siblings okay. and your folks and your education and how or who inspired you to become a sister. Okay. So with that as an entree, I invite you to continue the well, story. Well, thank you, okay. thank you, Peg. Um, in the 70s, there was a wall hanging that I saw. I don't even know where I got uh -huh. it. It said, I am because of my parents' love. And I gave that to my parents. And I have now realized that who I am initially or in my core is because of my mother and father. Mm -hmm. uh, who I became was influenced by many other people and experiences, but I'm a first generation Italian American. Good. Uh, mm -hmm. There aren't many of us in, no. this, in this congregation, but my mother and father were actually born in the same province in what is considered South Central Italy on opposite sides of a mountain. Oh my. my father was born in 1909. Uh, my grandmother was only 16, and my grandfather was 25. Uh, and in, in what is, the town is called Calitri. My mother was born in 1911 in another small town called Cairano. My grandfather emigrated first, my grandfather Bevilacqua immigrated first because Mama Bevilacqua had a sister living in New Rochelle. And so he went after when my dad was only a year old mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then sent for, which is what people did in those days, he sent for his wife, Got it. Mama, and my father, who was probably not quite two. We think he was about 18 months old. Anyway, 21 days in steerage. Oh, my word. They were so, oh. they were very poor, very poor. When they got to Ellis Island, they were quarantined for 21 days because there had been an outbreak of cholera. So that's how my father's side began in the United States. My mother, on the other hand, didn't come until 1927. Oh. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So my father, in many ways, uh, was more Italian-American when he met my mother. But my grandfather, we now know, had to be an extremely bright man, even though he refused to go to school in Italy. We know he had some education, but not much. Okay. And so because he refused to go to school, his father put him to work as a stone cutter, what we would call a bricklayer, a stone cutter. And at the time, <clears throat> an aqueduct was being built by the Italian government. So my grandfather is really from the eastern part, from a body which is on the east coast of Italy. But working his way on the aqueduct, he got to Calitri and went into a bakery and met my father's mother. Mm -hmm. And so that's how that story began. Came to the United States mm -hmm. in uneducated. Now my grandmother was, she had had schooling in Italy. And by that we mean she probably had at least through the eighth grade, which was saying a lot in those days. So Papa, because he was illiterate, uh, had a very hard time. So he had all kinds of jobs, including one time he had a saloon. 
But eventually, he uh, established himself in a shoe shine hat cleaning business. And then other children began to arrive. So ultimately, my dad is the oldest of 11 children oh born to my grandparents, yeah. mm -hmm. but only 10 lived to maturity. Um, one of the girls, uh, the first, as we say, the first Josephine, uh -huh. uh, died of acute meningitis. So they settled first in Hartford. And Connecticut? Then, yes. Okay. And then, no, in New Rochelle. New Rochelle. Okay. New Rochelle. And then Hartford. And then in Brooklyn, in different parts of Brooklyn. And Papa worked as a stonecutter. But, you know, the unions were very powerful in those days, mm -hmm. but didn't know how to maneuver the, yeah. the, the unions. So ultimately, as I said, he got this hat cleaning, shoe shining business. And my father worked, he shined shoes from the age of seven till he was in medical school. And the authorities... That's right, your father was is a, doctor. a doctor. So somebody reported my, fa my grandfather to the authorities that this young child was shining shoes. <laughs> so Papa goes before the judge and he says, at le you know, I'm sure in his broken English, uh -huh. uh, at least I know where he is. He's with me. I don't have to worry that he's getting in trouble with any gangs or, you know, not that my father would have, oh, but no. <laughs> anyway, the judge agreed. So my father kept working. Um, now, of those 11 kids, 10 kids, that's where your uncle... Uncle Tony is... Uncle there Tony. are five girls and five boys. Okay. My father's the oldest, as I said. The youngest one, Madeline, is... Well, actually, they're all dead. Yeah. Uh, except one. Uncle Frankie is still living. But Aunt Madeline... My father was in medical school when Madeline was born. So on my mother's side, they came in 1927. They're living in Brooklyn, and there was a midwife in, in the neighborhood who mm -hmm. says to my mother, who's 16, I'm going to help with the delivery of a baby. Would you like to come? And so my mother said, I would love to. It was the Bevilacquas. And it was the birth of what it would have been the tenth child. But really, we say she's the ninth. Got it, yeah. And it was yeah. Gloria. Mm -hmm. And it's in the home of the Bevilacquas in Brooklyn. And Mama and Papa are arguing about what to name this baby. Because in the Italian tradition, there are very strict rules about mm -hmm. how you name the children. Mm -hmm. Papa wanted Gloria, Mama wanted Magdalena. So Papa says, let the stranger decide. Who was the stranger? My mother. So they put the two names in a hat, and Mama picks out Gloria. That's how she met my father. Okay, okay. She was 16 years old. He was 18. He was already finishing, almost finished college, because he was so bright that they skipped him in grades when he was younger. Oh. And the teachers went to my grandfather's store and they said, he has to go to college. He's extremely bright. And so my grandmother decided he will be a doctor. She had she decided. He she decided. Anyway, it's a very long story, Peg. Yeah, but which, which, uh, which is important. We want to hear this, but let's get down. Where, where do you fit into the history here? We so can't tell the whole they got married. love story. This they got exciting. married. They couldn't get married. You couldn't be married in medical school, and you couldn't oh. be married as an intern or a resident. So my dad graduated medical school in 33, finished his internship and residency in 35 of June. September 7th, 1935, they got married. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, 
By the way, the last baby was named Magdalena. The other name that was in the hat, the baby, Madeline. So um, <laughs> my mother lost her first child. And in those days, they told them not to get pregnant. Then the war broke out. Meanwhile, my dad is practicing. He's practicing okay, medicine. Uh -huh. He went from in, being an internist to a pathologist, got credentialed the whole bit. The war breaks out. Being an Italian, he feels it's this enough. country's been very good to him. He has to go. So I was born in 1941. Okay. Pearl Harbor, I was born right. in March. Pearl Harbor was December. In 1942, my dad enlisted. Oh my. At 33, he enlisted. So he was in the Army Medical Corps. Okay. He served in the European Theater, uh, landed on Normandy, did his first autopsy oh on word. the beaches of Normandy, oh was word. in mm -hmm. France, Germany, Belgium. Meanwhile, my mother realized they were pregnant. So I have a brother, God rest his soul, <laughs> he has died, who was born in November of 42. And my dad was at Fort St. Fort St. Houston in Texas getting trained. So in our family, there are five of us. Okay, I'm the good. oldest. The second one, Michael, God rest his soul, has died. So we say there's before the war and after the war. Because after the war, in 47, Noreen was born. In 48, Olivia was born. And in 51, Joe was born. So there's 10 years between Joe and, and me. And you, right. okay. So there were five of us for most of our lives. Um, mm -hmm. Michael died in 2012. So okay, that's, so then my, that's my That's your beginnings, family. yes, yes. Right. And, and it certainly tells us a lot about you as you look at your tradition and your history and the, the determination and the insight and the generosity of you. Uh, the family yes. that you came from. So now it's your family and you're in school. Right. Yeah. Um, so Grade school, high school. Yes. I, well, first of all, I was supposed to be named Maria Giuseppe after my grandmother. My father's the oldest. You name his first child after his mother. And I think how creative and how brave my parents were because right. they went against the tradition and the culture and they yeah. named me Linda and the priest said we're not baptizing her uh, that's not a saint's name and my mother said she's Linda Marie after the Blessed Mother he said her name will be Linda Marie my mother said no her first name is Linda her middle name is Marie eventually she won the day my grandmother was so do you have that trait <laughs> <laughs> My grandmother, Bevy Lacroix, was so upset. Oh dear. She did not visit my mother in those days, yeah. 10 days in the hospital. She was so upset that I wasn't given her name. <clears throat> That, that was a strong, that oh. was so strong. And many, not just in the no, Italian. in many, many cultures. Cu yes, many it, it, cultures. It's prevalent today in many cultures, too. And so Michael, my mother decided on Michael, even though my dad did mm -hmm. not want anybody named after him, but my dad was in the war, and my mother said, if God forbid anything happened, she wanted someone, her son, to be Michael Bevilacqua after her. But then, think about this. Noreen... Olivia, the only one is Joseph. My mother named him after my grandmother since she was Maria Giuseppe. Oh, yes. God. So anyway, I went to, in those days, you didn't go to kindergarten. Oh, yeah, no, we didn't, we have, didn't have kindergarten. We didn't go to kindergarten. Only, we thought only um, public schools. We thought only rich people went to kindergarten. Well, we didn't go to kindergarten. Mm -hmm. So I went to first grade to St. Thomas the Apostle in Woodhaven, which is in Queens, New York. Okay. And we moved when I was in 3B. In those days, you started school in January. I'm a March baby. I started first grade in January. And every six months, we got a new sister, and we changed grades. So it was like 1A, 1B, 2A, 2B, 3A, 3B, etc. Uh -huh. We moved in 3B, 
and I went, we went further out on the island to Jamaica Estates, where, which was closer to my dad's office and the hospital, and I went to Immaculate Conception Grammar School, which the Sisters of St. Joseph okay. of Brentwood, okay. St. Thomas the Apostle was Dominican Sisters of Amityville, then I had the Sisters of St. Joseph, and then from grade school, I earned a full scholarship to the Mary Lewis Academy, which the Sisters of St. Joseph founded and still sponsor in Jamaica Estates. So I walked to school okay. all through high school. It was like three blocks from our home. And our parish was Immaculate Conception, and the Passionist Fathers okay. yes. ran that. In 1957, my dad retired, resigned his position, and he and a former student of his decided to move to Miami and establish themselves there. They were highly credentialed. They had diplomates in anatomical and uh, uh, mm -hmm. clinical pathology. None of that was known in Miami at, at that time. So our dad moved in 57 with his partner, who was married, and dad lived with them, studied to take all the boards, because in Florida and California, there's no reciprocity. He had to sit for all the medical boards like a student graduating from medical school. He said, I'm not moving the family. Linda has one more year of high school. So we stayed in New York. I finished high school, and I get a letter that says, <clears throat> I have found just the right college for you. It's run by Dominican nuns. That's where you're going to go to college. Now, who's saying this? My father. Your father, okay. And where was What's that? What's weird is his partner, whom we called Uncle Eddie, they were Jewish. <laughs> He's the one who says to my father, you know, there's a college for women in Miami. Oh, Maybe Barry. that's okay. where Linda ought to go. Oh, my gosh. Oh. Never saw the place pegged till I arrived as a freshman. Went to the guidance counselor at Mary Lewis and said, by the way, my high school is still in existence, doing great. And we've gotten students at Barry from there. Oh, wonderful. So I went to her and I said, my father wants me to go to this school I never heard of. Mm -hmm. called, and I said, it's called Barry College. And she looks at me. Now, mind you, Barry was all of 18 years old at that point. Linda Bevilacqua, she says, that is an excellent college for women. Mm -hmm. That's how I got to Barry. That's how I met our sisters. Got it. Okay, and you had other experiences with the other, other congregations. Yeah, yeah, I did. Yeah. And, and actually, um, the one thing I do know, Peg, that I did, I was not one of those little girls who always wanted to be a nun, didn't dress up as a nun, <laughs> but being the second oldest of 30 first cousins, we all kind of lived near each right, other initially. Right. I was always playing school. I loved my chalkboard. I'd make them all sit, and I yeah. would teach them the alphabet and everything. So I guess being a teacher was what was I wanted what, yeah. to do. Being a nun, not so much. Uh -huh. So I am, I guess Margaret Phillip would have said, I'm a late vocation because I finished college before I entered. Oh, that's why you went out to teach right away, too. I had no idea. Yeah. I had no idea that most of the women w entered. Right before, after high school. Right after high yeah, school. Yeah, in your time. That's right, your age. That's right. My, that's what happened when I I'm entered sure a few years. Shared, yeah, yeah, with the same background. No, I don't have your background. Mm -hmm. Oh, Flynn and Bevel. <laughs> <laughs> but I just mean as far as the family dynamics. And we just entered right after high school. Yeah. Oh, no. Um, and my mother was not happy. No. Uh, no. You know, firstborn girl, um, she's going to come home, live with her parents till she gets married, and then she's going to have lots of little Italian babies. <laughs> oh, goodness. My father had a totally opposite reaction. Oh, he was for it. Mm -hmm. he, he just was not surprised. Okay. Okay. The one thing I know I had done all my life, and I don't know whether it was in grade school or at Mary Lewis, but I always prayed to know, what did God want me to be? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I entered in June of 1962. We are the last 
December crowd. Okay, and how many? It's usually the, the big numbers were getting smaller. We were smaller. very big. We're, I, I don't even know. We could be 15 now. But oh, yeah. we were well over, I would say, 80 or 90 yeah. when we entered. Yeah. 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 And those, those were the days. And that's not who we are right now. That's not who our world is. You no. notice that at the university. Of course. That school is not what it used to be. Uh, the pandemic's and, telling us well, a lot about the future, Peg, too. women have so many oh, right. more options today. Mm -hmm. uh, not that I felt that I didn't have any options. Mm -hmm. And, you know, sometimes the college students have asked me, well, how did you know? Yeah. And, and I said, I knew. Mm -hmm. It wasn't any big, you know, starburst. I knew that this is what God wanted me to mm -hmm. do. So I made my decision in the fall semester of my senior year. And since then, you know, with your education and your experience and, and leadership and the university leadership, and now you just, re I know we have a big span in there that we can't you know, find more <laughs> about. I have to go wait till I start round two of all these uh, sister stories. But um, what was the most significant ministry that you have been in, or the one that was um, well, the significant, impressed you? Uh, oh, gosh, so many. Yeah, I know um, we like all of what we've I, done. Well, I did enjoy all. From first grade, <laughs> <clears throat> that's what I was, first grade as a postulant, first grade newly professed, first grade at St. Bridget's in Detroit, got the card in the mail, you're hereby assigned to yeah. Barry College. So I went from first grade back to my alma mater in administration, came in and protested, asked to see Rosemary mm -hmm. Ferguson. I don't want to do this, she said. I, I am a very good first grade teacher. Oh I love those children. I said, I don't want a middle. I don't want you. Okay, which by the way, uh, Linda Bevilacqua is your baptismal name right now. I'm Linda but, Marie. Linda Marie, but you were Sister Nora Michael. I meant to say that at the beginning. That's okay. Be no, because many people who watch <clears throat> these sister stories, they don't know you by Linda Marie. They That's know you right. by Nora Michael. And some of our Irish sisters said to me, how is it that you're Italian and you got an Irish name like Nora Michael? And I said, oh, is that Irish? <clears throat> yeah, I was wondering, is that I Irish? I said, <laughs> well, Nora is a very Irish. Uh -huh. I said, actually... It's my mother and father. I said, my mother is Eleonora Immaculata Salemi. And <laughs> her family calls her Norina. And my father, every day of his life, called her Nora Deer. And my father was Michele. Oh. Okay. So I am Nora Michael. I was Nora Michael until 1969, from 63 to 69. That's beautiful. We, 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 we have to, we, we have to stop. You want to say which was most... Uh, no, no. No. There was, go on. Do, do you want to tell us about what was well, the most I think significant the, to the you? The for me was that when I protested, yeah. after an hour, Rosemary looks at me <laughs> across the desk. This conversation is over. You will go and do God's work. <laughs> and honestly, Peg... She saw in me what I probably would never have seen, potential. Mm -hmm. And so for me, that is a life lesson I have used and shared say, with other people. Mm -hmm. uh, every ministry taught me something. Dorothy Brown was, and Marie Grace Gibney were at Barry right. when I was sent there. They were highly influential in shaping me. Marie Grace was adamant that I pursue a doctoral degree. You know, I didn't quite see the need for that. And she said, if nothing else, it's a required credential, Linda. You are not going to be in student affairs for the rest of your life. You need. That's great. That's so wonderful. those women, the other thing Dorothy Brown taught me was the importance of 
of higher of an institution of higher education grounding itself in its tradition and in its charism you know so i reported to dorothy brown right mm -hmm. i reported to trinita mm -hmm. who had been my dean when i was a student mm -hmm. you know those women were so influential and as you're sitting here talking and in, in the energy with which you speak it's very obvious i see your mother you do? Yeah, I mean, her determination and her, this is the way it's going to be. <laughs> anyway, aside from all of this and your wonderful education, yes, we all are standing on the shoulders of tremendous women, and it's sad how we're losing them, um, but that's to be. Uh, so anyway, something else. Is there something that you would like to share with us <laughs> that's decent, well, at least <laughs> respectable, respectable, that we would be surprised at? knowing, oh my gosh, Linda, Bebalacqua, you know what she did, you know, I don't know. I don't know if it's what, I love to play act. Okay. When we were on the council, I don't know if you knew that um, for the sisters, I created a Wheel of Fortune, and I was Sister Vanna White. And <laughs> Wonderful. I have a wig, and a blonde wig, and they had no idea who it was. And I did all the questions about the history of the congregation. And then when I was in, when I was president of Barry, on Founders Week, we always had a theme. And I used to say to the team that I worked with, you know, we, we have to be part of the theme. And that means we have to wear costumes like everybody else. So yeah. I Good would for you. Mm -hmm. create all of that, like we did the 60s. and. We were hippies, and then we did the 70s, and then we did the 80s, and so I love doing all of that. Okay, okay. That reminds me of Halloween. We have a great time at Halloween here. I, I haven't been part of it recently, but it's a time to get dressed up. Some people don't like that. So the next time you want to do a play or something, get in touch <laughs> with me because I, there's, that's a part of my... Uh, urge too. I always I said I always wanted to be a movie star. Well, but anyway, <laughs> we, we have to stop. That funny? Yeah. Yeah. No, because <laughs> I used to think I'd like to be an actress. <laughs> okay. Let's meet later. Okay. <laughs> on stage. <laughs> anyway, Linda, we have to we have to say oh. stop at this point. But this will not be the end of your life story because there's a lot in between that we haven't been able to share. But just know in the name of the congregation, thank you for you and thank you for your generosity and the way that you have lived the mission and the charism of what we are all about. We are proud to call you sister. Well, thank you. Yes. My life's been blessed. Yeah. I, I can't imagine being anything else other than an Adrian Dominican. Good. And Wonderful. I've been so thank you, Sister Linda Marie Bevilacqua and Sister <laughs> Nora Michael. <laughs>